Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, and our guest today, and also my co-host, is Janelle Blue. Janelle has been researching and studying the field of genealogy for over 15 years, and she previously held the position of president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society for four years, the first person to do that. So, <laughs> so Janelle, your career was in finance. How did you make the jump to genealogy? There's not really a connection there. <laughs> well, I have always been interested in, in researching my family, but once I retired then, I took the opportunity to join the National Genealogical Society and begin to attend their week-long conferences and some of the other events. And that really gave me a good overview of all of the disciplines that are involved in researching genealogy. So from there, I took the 16-week uh, Boston University certificate program that really helped me uh, understand proof standards and uh, research standards and then um, began to, to attend some of the institutes. I think I've attended all of the institutes at least once. once. And the one that's really relevant today is the, the GenFed uh, program, a one-week program at the National Archives. And that really helped me understand all of the, all of the documents that they've got. And what we're basically going to focus today is military documents that a lot of them have been digitized and are on a database called Fold3, which is now owned by Ancestry. Now, they have a lot, but they don't have everything. So there are times when you still have to go down to the archives. But That's right. tell us a little bit about Fold3. Well, it started as an independent database, and then um, when Ancestry uh, acquired them, it's part of your, if you have an Ancestry subscription, the premium subscription, it would be part of that. Um, it's also free if you go to a, li a participating library, like at your university, or even many of the local libraries offer that. And also family history centers too have exactly have it yeah so so you you know it's about eight dollars a month if you if you subscribed but you could get it free th through, uh, through these other sources and you know military records are really important um, resources if you are trying to validate certain vital records or place your ancestor in a time and place um, it, it's, if you were, in a way, if you were lucky enough to have someone who served, I mean, it, it, then, then you're, you're likely to find some good information. If you had gone to the National Archives a few years ago and wanted to do this research, it's kind of overwhelming, um, and their catalog used to be overwhelming. It's, it's getting better. Um, but now we have full three. And that is the one of the, the National Archive is probably the one source um, that is, um, that has the most information there in, in Fold 3. And what exactly does the name Fold 3 mean? There's got to be some connection to the military. Well, have you, if you've ever seen, um, you know, when some, when a, when a, a military person dies and in, at the funeral you've seen the, the flag gets folded into sort of a triangle. Right. And so the third fold in, the, in some of those ceremonies honors and remembers veterans for their sacrifice in defending their country and promoting peace in the world. So that's, that's what that's that means when you see that third fold. And, um, and so what wars do they, rec do they cover in fold three? Everything. Almost everything. Now there's a little bit in, in, I saw something for Iraq, but mostly it's the more historical things. And I think we have a, a slide that will show you the homepage uh, of Full 3, and it, it has all of the different, not all of them, but it, has, it shows you a lot of the different wars that they cover. There it is. 
Um, and it, you will notice on there, it says that they have over 582 million records on Fold 3. Um, the National Archives has got many more than that, but, but this, is, this is the part that is easily accessed and that is something that would probably be relevant to your research. So, you know, what, what are the sources in the, the records? You know, what, what do they actually have? So, um, so let's just start with the revolutionary. Well, let's, let's just take a look. And if you go back to that other slide and you, you push on the Revolutionary War, then what you just saw on the screen would come up. And there are um, 46, I'm sorry, there are 24 publications, and those are like categories. So when they get, when they get back up to the other one, uh, the other screen right before this, um, when, that's it. So each one of those is a publication, and there, I'm not showing you all of them, I'm just showing you a sample of how it would go. If you were interested in any one of those, you would click on that, and then that would start the process of, of looking for your ancestors' document. And if we looked at the, let's just say we're looking at the Revolutionary War pension files, for instance, um, so you would click on that, publication and then it would take you to a surname well at first it would take you to the state what okay. state were they and and that doesn't necessarily mean the state they lived in it could be the state that they um, that they where they requested the pension it could be where they served where they were um, last served but so try several different things if you can't get it but that will the state, and then then you begin the surname, and it'll it, it'll give you the, you know, the alphabetical, and then it will start giving you um, detail within that. And of course, you know, just like today, not all of our ancestors stayed in one place, so it's quite possible they served from one state, but moved on to another state. I'm very fortunate in my research. My ancestors really didn't move around until ah. my parents' generation. So <laughs> Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and I don't have to worry about the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so. even so, some of the regiments changed and, yes. and got yeah. folded into other regiments other, that yeah. were from different states too. So. Yeah. so what kind of records might we actually find on Fold 3 for? an ancestor? Well, the obvious ones are the muster rolls. Um, they have lists of all of the, um, the different people in a particular regimen by state. Um, so you can sort of verify that your ancestor was there, although, you know, not 100%. Yeah. Nothing is 100% <laughs> here, but from the records that they have, um, you know, that's the first step is were they there and what regiment were they in? Um, and and what, how did they serve? Were they an officer? Were they private? How long were they there? And so forth. And then one of the most valuable uh, 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 documents is, is if they applied for a pension because the pension required them to talk about, to tell about themselves. Where did they serve? When did they join? Uh, were they in any battles? Most, most of the time, the veterans are happy to talk about the battles that they were in. Right. And, um, and then sometimes they talk about their family in the initial uh, application, but often maybe not as much. It's only until they die and the widow wants to continue the pension. Then you're gonna see a whole nother file and that's when you start to get some of the goodies. And that's, that's when everything changes. And, and like you say, you really do get the good stuff. Uh, well, hopefully you do, because, <laughs> because they had to prove often that they were married to that person. And in order, and you know, in those days, they didn't have vital records that they could go to easily. So, and many times even the church register wasn't available, and so they had to go dig up the preacher who married them, perhaps, or get 
a lot of different people in the family to attest to the fact that they were married. Well, and sometimes there are the records and they don't necessarily know. My second great-grandmother was applying, her first husband was killed in the Civil War, mm -hmm. and it asks about there being a record. Well, New Jersey had vital records starting in 1848. So yes, at the oh. state level oh. or the county level, maybe back then, I don't know for sure when they moved things to the state yeah. uh, you know, records offices, but there was a recording of their marriage, both in the church records and the vital records, but her answer was no. There wasn't any records. Well, she probably lived, she probably didn't live in a city. No. Um, and that birth yeah. was probably, you know, not recorded. Well, this was the marriage, know, but. Or the marriage. You know, the marriage, but, yeah. but uh, you know, and, and she certainly, because she attended the church that she was married in, she certainly could have gone down and asked, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. obviously didn't because her answer was no. And so, yes, she has the affidavits of other people to attest to the marriage. So, so, the, so those pensions then, um, from a genealogical standpoint, can really provide um, and supplement information that you can't find somewhere else. And as we're going to, I'm going to summarize a few of the documents and, and you'll see that in some cases, man, the whole family and the births and everything is, is in there, which is a dream for a genealogist. Yeah, yeah they, and, and of course, I always say you don't want them to get the pension on the first go around because then you get more affidavits and things mm -hmm. from yeah, different right. people and yeah. my, my experience with early military records is very limited. Uh, I have a War of 1812 third great grandfather. His daughter is the one that married the guy that was killed, the first husband that was killed in the Civil War. Well, her pension file is like 14 pages. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a couple affidavits, mm -hmm. the paperwork, she was approved. She married her, her second husband, and he was a veteran. So she, of course, lost her benefits, mm -hmm. but she still had minor children that- So they got it. They got the benefits. So, so you know, and then, then her second husband, of course, was already getting a pension when, when they were married. So, but again, his, his file is like six or eight pages long. And then I've done work for people where it's 50, 60, into hundreds of pages. Yeah, and yeah. those are the ones that I just, so envious of the people that have those files because there's so much in them. And I think those might be more Civil War. Um, yeah. The Revolutionary yeah. files are not, don't yeah. seem to have, they're not quite that dense. But, yeah. you know, the thing is that, um, so Congress established a Department of War back in 1789, and they were supposed to keep all the records. And then Washington was burned in 1800, and they, they lost some of the records. And also in 1812, when the British yeah. occupied Washington. Now, they were supposedly in a fireproof fi uh, cabinet of some sort. I, I don't know what kind of fireproof cabinets they had back in those <laughs> days. Um, but the story is that um, some of the files were not in that cabinet, and some people carted off some of them. Mm. So the government has gone back to private collections to access a, a lot of the stuff that we have today is from private collections. So that's so if if your ancestors' information is missing, it could be, especially Revolutionary War times, for that reason. Well, um, one one of the things I'm I'm aware of because I did some work for somebody is looking at what does the state have? The state usually has for Revolutionary War militia records. Mm, right. And then if the unit was called into federal service, the federal government took over. But I have found at least in New Jersey that New Jersey still had records for people who, or men who were 
in federal service. So, mm -hmm. you know, all may not be lost if the federal records are gone, checking into the state records to see what they had. And, and in fact, what I was dealing with for this person was three men living in the same county with the same name. Oh, geez. Yeah. Fortunately, two of them were married and had wives who had different names. Oh, so yeah, so helpful. that that all <laughs> played into being able to sort out which guy are we really looking at and was able to to get her the information she needed. In this case, she was trying to get into the DAR. Mm. And with what I was able to get from Trenton, it was able to, to answer the questions and get her into the DAR. Oh, that was good. So they, these are, if you're interested, this is record group 15. This is the records of the Veterans Administration at the National Archives. And it was digitized from microfilm publication M804. For those of you who actually want to go into the catalog and perhaps um, look at records. But the bulk of what of military records that we have today is from, from that information. And now, Fold3 does have access to some of the other sources, like you were talking about, the state, some of the state um, sources, some of the archives have information, and so there's some of that for Fold3. Right. But it's not, a, you know, it's not yeah. consistent, so it, it will tell you if, it, if they have it. And of course, New Jersey doesn't really play nice with, with a lot of these. <laughs> I have people who will say, I found an ancestor in New Jersey. What can I find here, there? Nothing. You have to go to the state archives. They, they, don't, they don't put things up or allow a whole lot to be put up onto the website. You know, I, I, I just want to make sure that we get to talk about some things. And so I'm, let's skip over to the Civil War because okay. um, now, there's many, many more documents for the Civil Wars, and that that's, makes sense because it was a little bit later and, and things had improved Go, a little slipping bit. Slipping back just one thing for Revolutionary War of 1812 is also there are the bounty land records where yeah. the men were serving and for their service they got uh, bounty land, but again it was different acts being passed that widened the, the, the uh, number of people. For example, my War of 1812 third great-grandfather didn't qualify for bounty land until 1855. There was mm. an act passed on the 5th of March and he died the next day, but his wife was able to collect that bounty land. So those records are also good sources for information. And you know, Congress always started out with a, with a big limitation, and then over time it, yes. it broadened and it broadened. Yeah. So by the time these Revolutionary War period uh, pension, pensions were um, almost available to anybody. anybody, you didn't have to have a disability anymore. Yeah. And But yeah. a lot of, by the time they finally got around to that, it was mostly widows who were yes. Yeah. Who were left. Yeah, and that's what his widow applied and got the bounty land. And Christine Rose has a very good book out on all of the bounty land pension acts and everything. If if our viewers are looking for in depth information, uh, you know, it's it's a good book to to consult. Uh, so. and, and you know, if you if you read. Um, if you read about the Ohio River Valley, um, the settlements there, and, and, and you know that those veterans were trying to monetize those, the script that they were, the payments that they were right. given, those soldiers, you know, needed the money, but they had, the, the country was broke at the point. And so by giving them land warrants for the you know, Michigan and, and, and Wisconsin, those states that became part of the O River, the Northwest Territories. Right. Um, I mean, that's, that's one way that those soldiers were, those veterans were rewarded. Rewarded, yes. So, so then move on to the Civil War. <laughs> okay, so, so the uh, Civil War is the same thing. Congress started out, um, it, well, actually it was probably the president uh, of, 
of this amnesty you know who who could who was eligible for amnesty and most most soldiers you know they signed an oath of allegiance and there you have it you know that was all they didn't have to do much else but there were some people who were not eligible for amnesty and so some of the records in full three and national archives are these requests from these veterans from um, the southerners mm -hmm. uh, for amnesty and here's what happened if you were a public official or part of the administ the confederate administration or you had a certain amount of wealth um, and maybe some other things then you weren't eligible for that broad amnesty right and you had to go in and make your case and plea for that and so some of the some of the records that are in there are really interesting um, to read. And I, I have one, well, for instance, there's a guy named Benjamin Adams, um, and he, I'm sorry, that's, that's not the right one. Let's talk about, um, well, just in the interest of time, um, I want to talk about one called, the, the veteran was called, uh, no, he wasn't a veteran. It turns out he was an assessor of taxes, and his name was Pleasant Thurman Tannehill. And in 1865, he wrote to Andrew Johnson, the President of the United States, and this is in full three. He was a lawyer, and he was an assessor of taxes, and let me just tell you what's all in there, because we don't have time to read the whole thing. First of all, he describes himself. And, um, and he literally says, he's 49 years old, five feet 10, light chestnut, curly hair, Roman nose, gray eyes, sallow <laughs> complexion, 115 pounds weight. He's a native of South Carolina, and then in parenthesis he says, for which accident he hopes that he will not be held responsible. <laughs> then he goes on to say, I didn't claim, I didn't seek this office, but someone it was tendered to him by the chief collector of taxes and he accepted it for two reasons and one of the reasons was that he had been registered with the, the militia and he was subject to be called up at any point right. so by taking this position that would keep him from as he said uh, be compelled to bear arms against the government that would have been repugnant to his feelings so that was the first one and then the second one was he said if I had not been, if I had not accepted the appointment, it might have been given to quote some zealous Confederate who would have taken, who who would have had it in his power to have greatly oppressed the people, especially those who were known to be favorably affected to the government of the U.S. Now, when you think about that. Here he is, and he's saying the reason that he became the assessor of taxes was to do it truthfully and fairly, because if someone else who was really a zealous uh, a Confederate had gotten that, he could have, he could have over-assessed his neighbor who was not in favor wow. of the secession. And I mean, that brings to mind what was going on in those areas? This was the county of Llano, Texas, which is kind of out in the boonies. And um, think about it. Think about all of those people who lived in those states who maybe weren't uh, in favor of the secession, and, but with the people in power who were, if they got wind that you weren't. Right. Um, so I mean, so all that- All kinds of problems they could have caused for them. From a genealogical standpoint, it helps you understand what might be going on. And you probably don't know whether or not your ancestor was for or against. Yes. Maybe you do, but um, you may not. But you can at least now know that that kind of thing, that division was affecting right. even the most common person in, yeah. in, and, in the county. And particularly in the southern states you had, you know, 
brothers who disagreed who went off and fought against yeah. each other. Yeah. You know, so it, it was uh, you know, just a, a time when, when there were a lot of things going on. And having something like that, you know, to understand his point of view and you, know, you may not find that kind of thing for your ancestor, but there again, sometimes it can give you some insight into probably how they felt one way or the well, other. Well, if your ancestor lived in Llano County, for instance, it, it brings to que the question, um, you know, how, what was going on Go in on. the county at the time. Just to sort of finish up with this guy, he... He, he, even tells the guy, the, he even tells the president who he's voted for uh, all mm. these years, just to kind of, I guess, give him some idea uh, that he's really loyal. And then he, then he states his, his assets, which is also valuable for yes. a genealogist. And he says that excluding slaves belonging to his wife, and no doubt they were dower slaves, just like George Washington had with right. Martha, um, his, his assets were $4,000, but then they were 2000 after the war. Um, and he, you know, makes his house out to be very small and so forth. Anyway, he, he ends by wishing the president a long life and happiness and that may you never see the sunset on a divided union. And, uh, and that's, and that's uh, three pages of that. Now, Willie, tell you, when you go on to these records, they are really hard to read. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. so, from that standpoint. Well, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you, Janelle, for sharing this with us. Uh, there's a lot more on Fold 3 that, that we haven't had time to cover. So, I see a future program oh. where we can come back and revisit that. Uh, I want to invite our viewers to join the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society as far as attending some of our meetings. We're still virtual. The Senior Center has opened and we're hoping to be able to start meeting in person in the next couple of months. But if you go to our website, there's a lot of information on the society. And we have lots of special interest groups um, that are uh, coming up. So by all means, check us out. We'd love for you to visit and join. <laughs>